What do you get when you cross an owl with a bungee cord? My ass. <laughs> Enough! At around the end of Kung Pao, the chosen one flips a shuriken. It's also the moment the story flips genres. Let's jump back for a second. The first act of the story makes us believe that we are about to watch a kung fu parody. We have a thought-provoking setting, a large cast of colorful characters, and a charismatic hero to defeat the evil villain. Visually, the movie looks absolutely nuts. That's a lot of nuts! It saturizes the tropes of the genre, and it's signaling to us that it's going to take these familiar genre elements and make them as big and splashy as possible. We think we have a good grasp on the kinds of twists this story will take, but then... What in God's name is that thing? Writer, director and actor Steve Udekirk throws a curved punch that we weren't expecting. He convinces us that we already know the answer to how our protagonist defeats Betty. An extended expository dialogue tells us exactly what Betty's weakness is. It's at this moment that the movie ceases to be a kung fu parody and instead follows the structure of a different genre parody revenge stories. Now I know those sort of sound like the same genre, and yes, parody revenge stories are a subgenre of parody, but even though they have the same subject matter, you're going to think of them as different genres in this video, because they differ on two points. They have different protagonists and as a result, they have different story structures. In parody, the main character is obviously the protagonist and we see the events from their perspective. There are three major beats to this story. Funny scene, then funny scene, and another funny scene. This formula has been done so many times and audiences have become so familiar with it that the parody movie genre is anything but funny. Parody revenge story on the other hand is different because it is not funny. And we follow two the characters. A good example for this would be Star Trek Into Darkness, a motion picture that flips Spock's character from a calm, logical, stoic personality to a complete animal. Oh my god. In one of his lectures, Gary Stahl, the writer of The Anatomy of Memes, makes a distinction of the two genres as such. Parodies are funny. Okay, so now that we got our building blocks for each genre, let's see how Kung Pao combines them together. We start with the murder of the Chosen One's family, while introducing our main characters. Usually this is separate, but Uda Kirk brilliantly combined these two acts into one. He uses this traumatic event to motivate flashbacks so we can see both visually and narrative-wise what is happening on the screen? The Chosen One's past could have been revealed in the middle of the movie, but by putting it right at the beginning, Udeker gets us through all of this in 5 minutes. It might prove difficult to arrive to this conclusion, given the number of various themes the movie builds itself on, but I evolved as a crick, so I know what I'm talking about. Around the 20 minute mark, our antagonist makes a decision. From this day forward, you will all refer to me by the name Betty. He changes his name from Master Payne to Betty. However, things went south after the following reaction. But isn't Betty a woman's name? The Chosen One decides to show his transphobia to the audience. This moment elevates our evil antagonist to be a more sympathetic villain, because Betty's views are being challenged. I am nice man with happy feelings. At this point we are rooting for both characters to succeed and thus we continue with act 2, the actual revenge that takes place in the middle of the parody revenge stories. The chosen one, even though he was warned of the dangers of Betty, decides to face him at the waterfall. It goes without saying he is outmatched, his revenge ends in failure and is forced to retreat. Now most movies that follow this particular structure would follow this with the final act, the point where our hero overcomes his challenges, but here we see yet another failure from our protagonist. Chosen one! <laughs> While he's on his way to rescue Lin, he is disabled by a tiny net. This scene at first glance would look utterly confusing, but as the years come past, I think I have a good idea what this scene is about. The net represents cancel culture. Betty and the evil council's devilish plan is none other than cancelling the chosen one. We get hints of this at the beginning of this act. What is the evil council's plan? Huh. It is evil. 
Man, it is so evil. It is a bad, bad plan that will hurt many people that are good. I think it's great, because it's so bad. After seeing the carnage Barry and his men have conducted, our protagonist decides to put an end to this madness and bring peace to the land. From this moment, I will stand for the opposite of killing. Gnadab. Later, Barry is informed about the Chosen One's whereabouts and is headed to the shrine, unknown to him that our hero is more than ready to face him. My name's Betty. And this is where our story comes back to its roots, by changing the genre back to parody. The moment the shuriken hits the boombox is the moment we know that our expectations are subverted. The Chosen One doesn't hold back. He is determined to finish this conflict once and for all. But aha, you've been watching movies your whole life. And you know that this can occur in any action movie. So why did we categorize this under parody? Now, it is totally fine to dislike this opinion, so let's talk about why this is not an objective statement. It's partly because most people don't know what a funny movie is, and even fewer know how a good comedy works, so to even make this critique you have to have a certain knowledge of how to write comedy. But on top of that you have to believe that adhering to tropes established in other films is more important than the immediate impact of the scene. The fact that the fight is so unorthodox is the non-verbal way of communicating an idea to the audience. It justifies for our mind why the scene is so ridiculous. Whichever side of the argument you land on, it's simply a personal preference and what's important is how did it make you feel? Artists are faced with these kind of trade-offs where they can choose to sacrifice the logic of a scene to a degree in order to improve other qualities of the film. But to understand this we need to talk about Marxist reader response theory. In this case, his letter to Engels from July 30th, 1862. Oh, um, maybe not. Anyway, sponsor time. Thanks for the money. Keep writing. I now officially know too much. And why are you in bed? Oh, you won't even believe what happened next. No, please. 